Aloha Awinala. I'm Kawi Lucas, host of Hawaii is my mainland, off the grid and on the bright side of life in these islands, live streamed Fridays at 3 p.m. And then all our shows are accessible for the foreseeable eternity on YouTube and on iTunes as a podcast. Tomorrow, April 1st, is the opening of Contact 3017, the fourth annual juried exhibit exhibit of contemporary art exploring the notion of contact as it relates to the Hawaiian Islands, its people, and their experiences. This year's theme is Hawaii in a Thousand Years, thus 3017. In addition to the juried works, there are a few invited artists, and my guest today, Charles Veloroso, is one of them. Charles grew up on Kauai, then did his formal art training at California College of the Arts. Charles was one of the pioneers in turning downtown Honolulu into the creative heart of the city in the early 1990s, before Mark's Garage and First Fridays and Hi Sam. But for many years now, he has been living in the Bay Area, and I am happy to welcome him home. Hello, Charles. Aloha. <laughs> Great to be back. So you were lured here through um, the, the art that is, that is behind us. Um, Tell us about, uh, about the background here. Well, um, a couple of weeks ago, I got a call from, uh, well, a call, an email from uh, Josh Tengen, who's the curator for Contact 3017. And he said that we're going to use your painting um, on loan from the Hawaiian Tell to uh, use as a matrix for um, this futuristic show uh, depicting Hawaii as seen by visionary artists of Hawaii. It's a jury show. Um, I'm in because I'm in. <laughs> and uh, like I said, the, the painting was done 35 years ago in 1982 for the 1983 um, centennial celebration for Hawaiian Telecom. Yeah. Also known as Hawaiian Telephone back then. And um, so right now, uh, when I look back on it, it, it looks a little dated, but it's sort of on target because I was trying to project uh, 100 years from 1983 to 2083. And I had called uh, the painting Hawaii in 2083, and here we are at 2017. And look at it. We've got everything that your hearts desire in the high-tech industry. It, you, except you, right. we have also the element of humanity with uh, Kiki Okaina there and um, the iconic seashell projecting yeah. the sounds of the sea and using your imagination to, you know, um, foster a lot of ideas. And that's kind of what um, my whole platform is about being an artist. Okay, um, so let's go into your history a little. Um, uh, you were, uh, your small kid time happened to be near Lihue. Born and raised in Lihue, right across Lihue Theater. Uh, back in the 50s, when I was born in 1950, so you know how old I am, uh, we had uh, camps, and um, basically were, the camps were set up to um, furnish workers with um, being in close proximity to the mills or the, the sugar fields that they worked in. Both my parents were immigrants from Ilocos Sur uh, in the Philippines, and uh, my dad came as one of the earlier uh, wave, the first or second wave in 1926. I think the first wave came in 1906 from the Visayas. Fourteen men and um, they were uh, probably the pioneers for, you know, being the cane cutters and all that, but my dad came in the 20s um, at age 17 and uh, never went back. <laughs> but my dad was uh, kind of an artist too, he was a musician and his dream was to, to become like uh, an orchestra um, player. He had a band, you know, during the swing era. And he came to um, play on Hotel Street and the dance clubs that they had back in those days. But his day job was still working in the fields and later on in the, the sugar factory. So my whole, my whole background growing up until I left in 1968 was um, focused in that Lihue Plantation Camp. Well, that's something we share, um, although I had to leave the plantation, Eva Plantation in my case, 
when it was sold to Castle and Cook, and um, my dad had to have a different job. Yeah. Um, but there is something absolutely magical uh, about uh, the sugarcane um, industry as it was. It gets yep. a bad rap, um, uh, and there were certainly times when it was was awful and deserved that bad rap. But there was there was beauty in it too. They were these lovely communities, um, and the the way that people related to each other, um, at least in my memory as a child, was was beautiful. But let's talk about let's talk about the art. When I met you, um, you were um, really pounding the pavement around here in Honolulu. Was I? Um, <laughs> well, making making Honolulu uh, downtown Chinatown, you know this happening art place and it was sort of the the well the first wave I know of maybe there was one before that tried to do that and um, uh, you had the gallery on Hotel Street mm -hmm. 81 Hotel Street boom gallery boom gallery right and um, and then you recreated is this that boom gallery is it, that we're looking at here that was a show um, in Alamada Center based on uh, the Aloha shirt that Dale Hope had put together. But I was doing Hawaiian shirts back in the early 80s, even as far back as uh, my first years at school. So when I saw the exhibit, um, it was perfect to just have a little photo opportunity. But um, no, it's not my gallery, but it's uh, the exhibit they had last August in Alamada depicting the fashion industry for the Aloha shirts and from Aloha the shirts. 40s and 50s, yeah. Yeah, you were doing the Aloha shirt paintings. I have a little study for one that has just been such a part of my life. Um, they're, they're gorgeous. We have a picture of, um, I took one of my favorite paintings uh, that has the flying fish. So it's okay. it's the it's the it's the one where the where the images are flying off the shirt. <laughs> yeah. Well, it overlaps with all the different styles, and um, you know, I was searching for my my my, vi my vision or voice, as they say, in the arts, um, and I did explore with a lot of different techniques and so-called movements that started off in the '60s, throughout the '90s, and till today. And um, with each succession of phases and you know movements that I had adhered myself to, like. Um, it all overlapped and became part of this growth and uh, uh, evolution for what I started off doing when I when I first got interested in the arts back in the as early as back in the fifties when I was in elementary school. I, I knew I was going to be an artist since second grade. There's no question about it. Why? Th that could be a whole. Well, I had a lot of encouragement. I, I attended um, parochial school. Was Catholic. And we were in the middle of the cane field in uh, Lihui. And somehow the teachers, the nuns, were strict as heck. But they, they were sort of like very creative in the sense that they believed in creativity and the arts. Because I guess a lot of them came from Europe. Uh, huh. my, my, my teachers who were nuns came from France and Belgium. And they all spoke with these like European um, accents. And they used to give us little Renaissance, uh, what they call holy pictures. And um, that was my introduction to art back in those days, looking at Michelangelo, um, you know, paintings from the, you know, the Sistine Chapel and all that. Um, so and then I, I got involved with, like I said, um, the growth of the things that were happening to Hawaii in the 60s, right after statehood, particularly surfing and the West Coast culture. And... Um, and you went to school in California as well. Yeah, um, 1968, I left for Oakland, California. And it was known as the California College of Arts and Crafts back in um, the 60s. And then it, it changed to California College of the Arts when they started evolving more into um, architecture and you know, writing and design. So the focus now is more on design and um, high tech. Back when I was in school, there was a bunch of hippies and we were doing pottery and that sort of thing, but uh, I explored every facet of what uh, was to become my future uh, profession, and um, I really can't put a label on what I do. I just call it multimedia, I guess, 
because I've done everything from traditional painting and drawing to video and um, 3D things like architectural. Yeah, you know. we have we have a I have a, a smattering. W one of the um, uh, earlier phases um, also was the SF MoMA cars. I was just picking that up right. as one of the um, so highly stylized and uh, was that acrylic or what was what was that? Those are watercolors. Watercolors. Yeah. Wow. Okay. And oh, those, oh, it says yeah. right on it. Watercolors. Duh. Okay. Uh, well, actually, that the, that whole style um, originated when I started off at um, the California College of Arts and Crafts. Um, it was the post pop art era around the mid to late '60s when um, commercial imagery was starting to infiltrate the fine art realm of museums and that sort of thing with Andy Warhol, Lichtenstein, and a lot of the New York artists. So on the West Coast was this sort of like. Um, nebulous underground of other artists that were reacting to all of the abstract expressionist movements and then pop art and uh, some New York dealers started you know calling this new movement um, new realism and what they did is like they were painting from photographs almost religiously what they saw and depicted it in oils or watercolor or acrylics. Okay so I, I saw this one that has the Look, it's the beach scene with the um, two binoculars. Right. And it's like, is that a painting or a picture, a photo? I, c I could not tell, and it didn't say. Uh -huh. So what, what is that? That is a photograph, but I've done multiple um, variations of that, that photograph, which is my matrix, again, my source of information, um, uh, in oil, acrylic, exactly the way you see it. So... If you put the painting side by side, you can sort of see that the paintings look like paintings and the pho photograph looks like photographs. The reason I sort of attach myself to this particular um, image is that when I got there in 1968, um, I found out I had a, a cousin who was born and raised in San Francisco, and he was a surfer. And they all hung around Ocean Beach, which is um, called Kelly's Cove, uh, where the original playland used to be near the Cliff House. And uh, we used to hang out there and, um, you know, just like any other surf um, crowd in, in our, our cars and stuff like that and listen to Santana and <laughs> smoke weed, you know. <laughs> this was the 60s, right? And uh, down the street was like the Golden Gate Park and it was just about a year from the hippie oh, summer of love. Right, hate hate Ashbury. Yeah. yeah, so I, I sort of like uh, landed in that universe um, during my first years at the art school it was either that or get shipped off to Vietnam and um, oh wise choice oh, yeah, Charles, I immediately yes. um, you know I had to scramble to find out what my talents were and originally I wanted to be a forest ranger and major in forestry and probably come back to Kauai but I ended up in art school well I'm certainly grateful that you did let's take a little break and then c talk about um, why you're here in Honolulu now sure enough my name is Calvin Griffin, host of Military in Hawaii, which airs here on Think Tech Hawaii every Friday at 11 a.m. Please join us. We'll be talking about issues concerning our military, veterans community, and other related issues that concern all of us. Hi, I'm Nicole Alexander Enos, and I was born three weeks ago. Congratulations on being there for me for some of the few weeks of my life. I'm starting a new show, The Millennial Mind, every Wednesday at 2 p.m. for the month of April, where we'll go over some of the reasons why millennials are some of the most anxious and frustrated people at the moment. Hey everybody, it's me, Ian Davidson, host of a new show here at Think Tech called On The Go. What are you going to get during that show? I can't tell you. I can only tell you that it's going to be fun, and it's going to be sometimes, and I'm going to have a good time, and I hope that you do too. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff here at Think Tech. This is just another one. Take a chance on it. See how you like it. Thanks for watching. <laughs> Welcome back to Hawaii is my mainland. I'm Kaui Lucas. With me here today is the artist Charles Veloroso, who is a native of Kauai, but has been um, hanging out in the Bay Area for quite a while now. Um, he was lured back uh, to Honolulu this time 
um, as he is uh, one of the invited artists to the Contact 3017 show, which will open tomorrow, April 1st. It's at the Honolulu Museum of Art School. And um, tomorrow's uh, opening, which is from 5 to 9, will celebrate Here and Now with music by Davy Shindig, Food Trucks, and Shaka Tea, as well as Ava. So, I love this about it. Bring your own drinking cup and forks. They are going way sustainable. Oh no, use your hands to eat and mindfulness for the future. I'm, I, um, I gotta go. <laughs> even if you weren't, um, even if your piece wasn't going to be on. How big is the, the, the um, original of this piece, by the way? Uh, 36 inches by 24. Okay. It's scaled down to um, a double truck fold over for the then 1983 telephone book cover. They don't have telephone book covers anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, they do, but they, do. they all end in the trash and uh, because they're, you're not allowed to recycle them. Let's uh, not go down that okay. <laughs> road. <laughs> Let's keep focused. And, uh, Let's keep focused. Point. Um, and talking about the um, Honolulu Museum of Art School, I remember years ago I saw an amazing show that you were part of. Um, and I'm going to butcher the name, so I'll just let you say it. Uh, Kayabungi Presence, 1993. Yes. Yeah, it was a um, consortium of Filipino-based artists that was an international, um, you know, like exhibit from New York to, to the Philippine Islands. Um, and we were based in Hawaii. But uh, in 1993, there seemed to have been a uh, paradigm shift in the... Filipino culture. I don't know what spurred it on, but it could have been a lot of different things happening politically. Right, I was going to um, say. Post-Marcus, uh, you know, like um, martial law in the 80s, and then uh, Governor Cayetano being elected, and um, a lot of uh, newer um, people from the Philippines that were professionals that moved to Hawaii that weren't agrarian-based um, workers. They're professional nurses, lawyers, um, you know, writers and artists and that sort of thing. So we sort of started Kaimangi Presence as an underground thing to just kind of get, you know, works out there. But in the process, we found out that a lot of, a lot of other artists in L.A., New York, were doing the same thing. And somehow we just sort of, you know, used Hawaii as kind of this magnet and did this show. Um, 1993. I, I remember it being somewhat edgy. Um. Totally edgy because um, <laughs> Manuelo Campo is kind of like the rising, you know, like blue chip artist star b back in the early 90s was emerging out of LA. And um, I actually saw his work in Los Angeles, um, you know, in the Temporary Contemporary Museum back in, I think, the early or late uh, 80s. And uh, he was part of the show called Helter Skelter. And I couldn't figure out if he was Mexican or Latino or Hispanic. And with a last name like Ocampo and his imagery, there was like a lot of innuendos that had to do with the Philippine culture. And um, a year later, he started um, really rocking the boat in the art world. He got invited to Documenta in Germany and, you know, caused quite a controversy. So it kind of put um, the artists that were of Filipino heritage on the map the art world map, anyway. So you've expanded that that vision. So somehow in in doing that, I, it sounds like you got you worked on that um, part of your identity right. as a, as an artist of, of Philippine heritage, and it seems to have expanded to be more Pacific wide. Exactly. Now. Well, you know, it's been what twenty some odd years since um, that first show. Yeah, and, and um, I have I have a, a picture of that recent one in in Oakland. Right, um, um, that was done, done uh, in nineteen. I'm sorry, 19, 2015. And uh, what was the name of that piece? It starts with an O. Oracion. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> which is which means <laughs> prayer or um, um, offerings, and as I mentioned to you earlier, it had to do with. Uh, the Dia de los Muertos um, celebration annually that the Mexican culture has um, put on for centuries. 
Except this is a, a Pacific Islander uh, version of it. I mean, we have objects that are are Catholic, evidently, and there's a poi pounders and, and kappa. And right. Well, I, I had mentioned to the curators who had invited me to this exhibit um, that it's not quite um, a specific ethnic group from, you know, the Philippines or Polynesia. I, I've been exploring the whole concept of identity for practically my entire, you know, career, whether it was um, Hawaiian or uh, Filipino or being American. I mean, um, this is hybrid as you can get, and right. I'm neither. <laughs> In fact, I have a thing about the word Filipino because it has to do with colonization. I mean, it, it was derived from King Philip colonizing the archipelago 400 years ago. Wow. Yes, and people don't really realize no. that. So Filipino itself is like being called American or Canadian or, you know, um, European. It's just this blanket um, identity that they gave to the people of the archipelago. Say the north was Luzon, and then you have the Visayas and Mindanao. Now, all of this information never got taught to us in, in school books when we were growing up. But thanks to the internet, I just started really, you know, opening up the, the floodgates and researching a lot since my interest in the Pacific region um, sort of like, you know, came on my radar. As early back as, like I said, you know, the, the 60s, but it sort of was the definitive moment where I could really have focus and really have clarity about what I was researching to make my art make sense. Because it's all abstract to begin with, right? Well, and, and speaking of abstract, um, I, I now want to move us a little bit into the Kaimana Hila, okay. the diamond painting, um, which is uh, geometric but abstract. Right. Um, uh, so t t tell us about this. Well, Diamond Head, I, I lived in the Diamond Head area for practically all my life when I moved to um, Oahu after high school. And uh, this might sound kind of like, you know, uh, cosmic, but <laughs> the first place I landed was Diamond Head Crater on New Year's Eve. We uh, I, had, I, I had roommates in, in California at CCAC back then that were... Uh, from Aina Haina, and they're all surfers. A lot of people know Keone Downing, he's a uh, champion. Of course, yes. And uh, Ronnie Segarra, who was friends with, like, you know, a lot of the people like Jerry Lopez and Victor Lopez. And, you know, they had this whole contingent of people that lived in that area. And the first um, New Year I spent in Aina Haina, straight out of the shoots from art school, was, um, like I said, at the Diamond Head Crater Festival in 1973, I think. I don't remember. So they had this illustration of this uh, palely sort of looking iconic goddess coming out of the crater, and I liked the illustration and everything, so I thought, I gotta look for this guy, and I wanna work with him, you know? So Diamond Head became sort of this very iconic um, symbol for me uh, in my transition to Honolulu. Okay, but this is very geometric. Yeah. And um, I'm just, Wondering what that what well, it's the, it's the it's a it's an abstraction of a, um, a cut diamond, and um, diamond head is sort of like a a worldwide symbol, you know. But uh, people okay. don't understand that it's also a sacred place, like it's Liahi, uh, the birthplace of you know, like um, the goddess um, Kaimana Hila. I think her name was. She was a sister of Pele. There's something that goes along with yeah. that legend, anyway, and um, um, being, being in the surf culture, I used to hang out at Kaimata Beach and, you know, paddle around um, Doris Dukes and that yeah. whole we coastline. We called it Gomer's Pile at that time. <laughs> no. We called it, you know, Doris Dukes <laughs> or Old Man's. <laughs> okay, Old Man's, they still call it Old, old yeah. Man's. Anyway, um, I, I was going through this phase um, recently, only two years ago, where I was living in California, and um, I was always, like, you know, feeling the Hawaii vibe constantly, and I thought, how can I translate my feelings for Hawaii, but still make it relevant to the mainland and contemporary art, so I took the diamond as uh, an icon, and I started expanding on it, and I just did this thing from January 1st, 2015, 
painting one diamond a day. Oh. And these paintings are very tiny. Uh. The largest is about 8 by 10. But I have 365 um, diamond paintings, variations of it. <laughs> <laughs> and also, like, variations of the water um, reflections. I saw those, be those are beautiful, too. Yeah. yeah. The reefs and so that sort of thing. So I also found some... Uh, one of the things you've mentioned a couple of shows, that group shows, that and there's sort of movement, there's sort of community building, um, getting together with people of um, with something either in common Filipino ancestry or in the in the case of the Dios de los Muertos that, that it's something else. But um, I found uh, so you were helping this group in. Um, in California, the Harper for Kids doing, so this is another, I just liked it because it's so different. It's like, okay, well now he's doing graffiti. <laughs> well, it was like, um, Harper for Kids is basically a uh, mural project that a friend of mine um, whose um, wife is Peanut Louie, who's a tennis champion, and she's from San Francisco, and they created this um, book called um, Ancient Miles which was based on coach John Wooden from U UCLA. Okay. And he had his philosophy about the pyramid of success. Yeah. And he was a coach at, um, the basketball coach at UCLA. So anyway, um, the book became a roaring success. So um, they started using that platform to educate kids about being successful without having to be so academically up uptight. So we did this mural um, based on the 15 points of what constitutes success. Oh, and all okay. those building yeah. blocks from the base to the apex um, being that being successful, successful is being your personal best. There's no uh, gauge in terms of you know, points from 0 to 100. It's like if you're a 24 and that's your best, that's it. You're it. Okay. Well, okay. I want to talk about, in our last 30 seconds, okay. Nation of Poi. I love this. Nation I love of this. Poi um, was inspired by Barack Obama. We finally got a multicultural president, and I, I'm glad to say that I did my um, years in California from the day I got there um, under Obama's watch. And I thought, if there's a number one Poi dog in the world, Brother O is all about being a poor dog. So and you know I came up with that, that acronym called Pacific Ocean Islander, and it should encompass everybody who loves the Pacific, who's part of the entire Pacific Rim. And Kate, okay, and this one. So we're going to end on this. This is amazing. <laughs> I love that. That was a fun shot. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so tomorrow, April 1st, 5 to 9, at the uh, Honolulu Museum of Art School, yep. people can come and see it for real. Right, the original painting and see the real deal with what I presume the future of Hawaii will be about. Back to the Aloha. roots. Yeah.